I, a little background again because we get to chapter 17, the woman on the beast, and we get similar language. This is like, in a sense, would be like the fourth beast we've, we've looked at. But remember, uh, some of the common denominators that, uh, that we've seen so far is that uh, uh, we've, we've actually got uh, this unholy trinity. We got the first beast that came out of the bottomless pit. That was the fiery red dragon that was kicked out of heaven, Satan. Uh, Satan is just a little bit ticked off and, uh, and brings on the scene and orchestrates events for the second beast that comes out of the sea, which is the, uh, the Antichrist, the last world leader. Uh, again, and, uh, all, of these, all of these beasts, uh, these entities are described and have in common the idea that they, ha that they have ten horns and, uh, and seven crowns. The world will be divided up in the end into seven economic zones or seven zones around the world and we've already talked about the fact that uh, that has already been done and that is discussed every time world leaders get together economically politically militarily it's already mapped out it's already discussed and, and by the way we're in zone one which makes up canada the united states uh, in, in new mexico so this isn't like hey speculation maybe this will happen uh, in the future it's it's already it's we're there it's already there It'll be ruled then by seven kings who uh, are rulers who eventually are put down and the eighth king is the Antichrist who, who takes over. So in all of these beasts, the first beast out of the bottomless pit, Satan, the second beast who is out of the sea, the Antichrist, the third beast who comes out of the earth is the false prophet and there's where we get our kind of unholy uh, trinity. And so every time then we come across that kind of description, which we do in this chapter, we're going to talk about a woman who rides a scarlet beast, same thing, that has, represents the ten world regions, the seven kings, all described this, the same way. So again, the word beast gets used several times, uh, usually some details that are different, and we've, we've been through, uh, through them, but so... Uh, don't let, again, the symbolic language should just continue to, when it says, says that, you know, uh, that it's like, okay, we know what, it's talking about the world, it's talking about a world system, uh, the Antichrist is over a world political system, there's a false Christ that's over a world spiritual or religious system, uh, and Satan is, is the one orchestrating behind it. But now we're introduced to a scarlet beast and a woman that rides it that's described as a harlot, because in it we find details of how does this happen? How does the false prophet bring all these religions together? What are the common denominators? And we're going to find out that actually it all goes back to ancient Babylon and the teachings and the religion of ancient Babylon, the first religion that was in a rebellion against God, the first new world order, uh, we would say, has actually permeated world religions, including Christianity. Uh, and because, uh, uh, because of that, in order to talk about that, we need to talk about Roman Catholicism uh, because it has been the ancient Babylonian religion permeates Roman Catholicism as well as many of the Reformed churches uh, and you and I are influenced by it as well. How many of you celebrate Jesus' birthday on December 25th? It's because the Babylonians told you to do that. It's nowhere in the Bible. How can we call Jesus' resurrection Easter or Easter? Because the Babylonians taught us to do that. We're all affected by this. And, I, and, whole, and the idea is, is not to uh, bash Roman, Roman Catholics. Many of them are godly. They know the Lord. They're born again. Uh, but it's just to show that this influence, this Babylonian influence, and the Bible says it's going to affect everybody. It's going to affect everybody, not us Christians. No, it's going to affect everybody, but it helps us understand how does the false prophet do it in the end? How does Satan do it in the end? How does the Antichrist do it in the end? How does he bring all these world religions together? Well, there's a common thread, and he's going to go and just pull it, and it's all going to come together. Uh, very, I hope it's interesting to you, fascinating to me, and we're, and we're only going to skim over uh, some of the idea and some of the information that, uh, that we've got uh, time to cover this morning. So let's look first, and we're only going to hit the first six verses, uh, and we'll come back and, and look at some more of the complex details uh, of this uh, spiritual world religious system next week. 
in the, uh, the rest of the chapter. But uh, first we see that John has shown the final determination of this false religious system, which it says is punishment or God's judgment. That's in verse 1 and 2. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So the first thing we note is that the false religious system is illustrated as a harlot on many waters. Uh, and again, we first note that she is uh, a great a great harlot, and it's one of those, again, definite article in front of harlot, in front of great. John's saying this is strategic. It's very important. Uh, don't, don't miss this. And, of course, throughout the Old Testament, uh, there were many times that um, turning to uh, idolatry and then via turning to sexual immorality, both of those things were seen in, as the, in terms of the Jews, the wife of Jehovah, turning away from from being faithful to God and turning to prostitution or, or being unfaithful and so forth. That illustration is throughout the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we are the bride of Christ. Again, illustrations that help us understand how we're to be faithful as a man and a woman, husband and wife, or to be faithful to one another spiritually in terms of our devotion in our hearts, what we worship and so forth. The priorities of our life are to be like that as well, faithful uh, as opposed to what's going on here in this illustration. So she's a great harlot, uh, but, and again, she is sitting on many waters. Uh, again, a, a, a statement that, uh, that helps us understand that uh, it's the nations of the world that are being affected by this religious system. Uh, down later in chapter uh, 17, verse 15, it says, Then he said to me, The waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So that's not a, a speculation on my part. The text explains to us what the many waters are. Secondly, the false religious system includes world leaders. It talks about the kings of the earth who have committed fornication with her. So she seems to be sitting over this thing. She seems to be exercising authority. She is sitting on it. She is the one that is uh, in control. We're going to find out that this system turns, uh, in a sense, turns on its head here uh, in the end. But, uh, but the kings of the earth, the leaders, uh, are involved. Uh, back in chapter 14, verse 8, it says, And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all the nations drink of the wine of the wrath of for fornication. And that's who we're talking about, in a sense, Babylon, ancient, uh, ancient Babylon. Thirdly, the false religious system will seduce the inhabitants of the world, so uh, they are made drunk by the wine of her fornication. So here's some symbolically. Symbolically, she would use in the same way that a harlot would use sex and drunkenness to seduce someone. In that same way, she will use her powers to basically deceive. So tremendous deception uh, involved. And I said, we'll, we'll see how, in a sense, uh, through the fact that it, uh, all of these world religions all come out of ancient Babylon, there's a common teaching among all of them that's even spread within Christianity. She's going to be able to draw, this world religious system will be able to draw everybody, everybody together. How do you get everybody to join in together? You know, we all seem to be, have our own little things, you know, wherever you go around the world in terms of religious systems. But it's going to be done. It's going to be done because there's a common thread of a belief system that is the same, and it's going to be become because there's tremendous deception that's illustrated or compared to a harlot who seduces uh, uh, men around her. So uh, John's shown that there's a, a final determination, which is going to be judgment, uh, and he uses the word NIV, the word punishment against this world, this last world religious system. Secondly, John has shown that the definite, there's a definite relationship between the false religious system and the last world empire. We see that in verses 3 and 5. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy. And here's our common language again, having the seven heads and the ten horns. Again, the seven kings and the ten, uh, you know, uh, divisions of, of the world or the, of the earth. The woman was arrayed in purple 
in scarlet, royalty, adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls, so wealthy, nobility, wealth, having in her hand a golden cup, but notice it's full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication, and on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. So first we'd say there's a definite relationship as indicated by the woman sitting on the scarlet beast. So she is sitting, therefore she is the one uh, at least initially that has dominance over it. John sees that the beast is full of names of blasphemy. Uh, and certainly that's true of, of the cultures around the world that are against the Messiah or against Christ, against the one true God. Uh, their teaching is a blasphemy against him. I just thought of a, a very graphic example. Uh, as you look at pictures of, uh, of Jerusalem today, and one of the things that you see in the old city, very prominent, is that golden dome, the Dome of the Rock, which is uh, an Islamic uh, holy site. And, uh, uh, and around that, uh, that gold dome is, is some writing. It's in blue all the way around the band of the thing. It's in uh, uh, Arabic, just looks like very unusual writing to us going by. But what it contains is blasphemy against Jesus Christ. And that's what's featured around the Dome of the Rock. So again, this is one of the things that's common uh, among world religions and their view of Jesus as the Messiah who came, lived a perfect sinless life, died for the sins of the world, rose, rose again. Uh, there's a lot of other world religions that would agree with the teachings of Jesus and that he was a prophet and so forth, but this is where they, they depart, and, uh, and that is true of this world religious system. John sees him as full of names of blasphemy. The third thing John sees is that the beast had seven heads and ten horns. Again, this religious system is completely integrated into that last world order of the Antichrist, of the false prophet who's bringing it about and bringing everybody uh, into this system uh, and is energized and orchestrated by Satan himself. Secondly, there's a definite relationship. It's indicated by the woman's, by the woman's wealth. Uh, in chapter 18, verse 16, it talks about Babylon as the great city adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls, same description. Uh, and there's an accumulation of wealth by religion throughout human history, and it is awesome. And uh, we would say religion is, is big, big business. And, uh, and, and I, I mentioned before, but for example, for example, there is one religious system that is incredibly wealthy uh, beyond our imaginations. And they are happy to give you a tour and show you how incredibly wealthy they are and if you're in Italy and you go to Rome, you can go to Vatican and they'll show you their incredible wealth. And it is impressive. It is impressive. They are incredibly wealthy. Uh, and again, we're going to make the tie doctrinally here to show you that much of their belief system, unfortunately, was permeated right from the ancient Babylonian religion itself. And, uh, and if you're not familiar with that, just kind of try to uh, uh, stay with me here for for just a moment, we'll get to that. But, uh, uh, but again, it was uh, this world religious system at the end is a able to draw all those world religions together, including Roman Catholicism and what's left of Protestant, liberal Protestantism, along with the other world religions, and bring them together. And there's an appearance of tremendous wealth. Uh, and again, the colors that they wear, uh, the reds, the scarlets, and so forth, uh, all also uh, tied directly back to this image and directly back to uh, ancient Babylon, uh, the wealth in, uh, and so forth. Try not to get ahead of myself here. I want to make uh, one little other comparison before we move on, that uh, when God uses a vision of a woman in terms of her godliness, it's the opposite of this. Here's the woman on the beast, all of the gold, all of the jewelry, all of the wealth, the cup of wine in her hand, so on and so forth, as an ungodly image. The godly image is in 1 Timothy 2.9 and in 1 Peter 3.3. 3. Of the uh, women there, uh, Paul writes in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or 
costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness in, in, good work, in good works. Don't panic if you happen to have a pearl, a piece of gold, or your hair is in a braid this morning. Uh, it's not a condemnation, but uh, it is saying, and Paul was saying, don't dress like prostitutes. And I would say the same thing is true. Don't dress like and look like a prostitute. Um, uh, it, it, rather the opposite, uh, moderation, you know, and so forth. Yeah. 1 Peter 3, 3 says, Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing the gold. He's not saying don't do it. He says don't just do that, uh, but uh, putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. little side note, guys, it's kind of a really good verse to memorize, so when you go shopping with your wife, you can just kind of be saying it over and over, not with fine apparel, what was the rest of that verse? But uh, that's just a little side note there, just a little tip that could save something in the checking account for important things like surfboards, kayaks, and golf clubs. Because those aren't mentioned in the Bible. <laughs> Remember, Peter was a fisherman, so, you know, let's get that extra rod and reel is a godly thing. <laughs> but it, the point is, there's a, there's a tremendous contrast between who this woman is, and she's not a woman, she's an illustration of this uh, world religious system and God's view of, uh, of beauty in terms of a woman. Now, again, in uh, chapter 18, verse 16, uh, it's uh, kind of our same subject matter. It's going to continue here for a few weeks uh, they're saying, alas, alas, that great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple and scarlet. So again, there's a sense of nobility here and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, such great riches came to nothing. Third thing about the relationship, there's a different relationship uh, indicated by the judgment that is, that is coming. John sees a woman with a golden cup, which is a full of abominations and so forth. And uh, this is not the first time that this description is used. And we could actually do a little flow chart of the times that ancient Babylon comes into play in the Bible. Now, we're going to go back to Genesis 10 in a moment and read a few verses. That's where it begins. Uh, and, of course, its influence continues in the Old Testament. You've got prophets like Jeremiah and others warning against the gods of, of Babylon, one of which was Baal. The god Baal is a god of Babylon. So it continues and moves right in and, and has a play and is trying to influence the Old Testament saints. Uh, there's also the concern because of uh, the children of Israel, the Jews turning to idolatry and not honoring the Shabbats or the Sabbaths and giving the land at Sabbath rest that he takes them into the Babylonian captivity. And Jeremiah speaks about that in Jeremiah 51, 6. But notice the language is similar. He says, flee from the midst of Babylon, and every one of you save his life. Do not be cut off in her iniquity, for this is the time of the Lord's vengeance. He shall recompense her. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand uh, that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her, again, her religion. Uh, therefore, the nations are deranged. In terms from God's perspective, because of the teaching of ancient Babylon that went out through the rest of the world in its many forms, but there's some commonalities. The world has become like they're drunk spiritually, they're deranged. It was true in Jeremiah's day. It's true today. It will be especially true in the future. Uh, verse 8, Babylon has suddenly fallen and been destroyed. Wail for her, take balm for her pain. Perhaps she may be healed. We would have not healed Babylon we would have healed Babylon, but she is not healed. Forsake her and let us go everyone to his own country. So the golden cup, which is, I think, the teaching of ancient Babylon, is drunk. It's a cup full of abominations because it's against God. And we'll, we'll see that very graphically in, uh, in just a moment. Uh, again, one more passage from Revelation 18.5. Uh, talking about this, the sins of her abominations. Her sins have reached to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquities, rendered to her just as she rendered to you, and repay her double according to her works in the cup which she has mixed, mixed double for, for her. 
So again, the, there's a false religious system, kind of summarize here a little bit before we go on, on. The woman is compared to a harlot that's over the system or the system itself. She has seduced the leaders of the world and the peoples of the world. Her seduction includes idolatry and sexual immorality. And we could spend a long time on this, tracing back the prophets like Jeremiah, warning against the religion of Babylon that infiltrated Israel and the Jewish people. And it always led to idolatry and sexual immorality. And uh, I think that's going to be true. I think it is true in our day. It will continue to be true uh, in the future. And the other thing is that she has grown incredibly wealthy and appears to have a noble, a noble status uh, despite what's really going on. Now, the last thing about this relationship is indicated by the name written on her forehead. And this is where we'll spend a little bit of time. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of the earth. First thing we note is she is a mystery, which uh, in, the, in a New Testament, a mystery means it's something we didn't know and we know now. It's not like we talk about mystery novels and you read and read and read to find out who did it in the end. Uh, in the New Testament, it's something we didn't know and we do now and we do know. Uh, we know all about this world system. We know where it came from. We know how it affected the Old Testament saints how it infiltrated very early on uh, New Testament Christianity, not New Testament, but very on by about 3, 400, 500 A.D., infiltrating the church. We'll talk about that in a moment and how it's continued, and it will be part of the world order here in the end. Secondly, she is a mother, which uh, again speaks of the fact that she is the mother of harlots, so she birthed something. Ancient Babylon, the religion of mystery ancient Babylon, it did not end with the destruction of Babylon. By then it had moved. And by then its headquarters had moved again. And then it, it spread throughout Christianity as a result. And it had already spread uh, to other world, world religion. It's a mother of religions. It's the source of ancient religions. And it begins in Genesis 10. And in Genesis 10, you've already had the creation, the fall, the flood. And the next big event is you have the... Tower of Babel. And uh, at the Tower of Babel, which is located again there in the area of the Tigers and the Euphrates, you have a person that is mentioned named Nimrod. He's the guy that kicks it all off. He's the first guy that attempts to establish a new world order. In other words, he's going to rebel against God. God has clearly said, you're to basically spread out over the earth, take dominion over the earth. And he says, no, we're not. We're going to build one major city. And we don't need you, by the way, God. We're going to build our own tower right to heaven. We're going to create our own religion. This is where it all begins. Genesis 10, 8. Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one on the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And, and again, that word before can also mean against uh, in, in the Hebrew. And in terms of wondering whether he was against the Lord, we only need to, uh, to read on. Therefore, it said... Like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was, was Babel, or Babel, Arak, Akkad, Kalne, in the land of Shinar, or Shinar. From that land he went to Assyria and built Nineveh. Now some New Testament writers will say that Bab El means the gate of God, but you won't find that in any Jewish writing. They will say every time that that word means confusion. Because that's what happens. We know the story of uh, the Tower of Babel. Because it was in rebellion against God. They built the, uh, the t uh, that, uh, that tower called a ziggurat. Many ziggurats have been uncovered in that part of the world, Iraq and Iran. There's one in particular that seems very distinctive for the others. Archaeologists believe it is the Tower of Babel. But the common denominator is there's a worship area in the base of the tower. And then one at the, uh, at the top of the tower. Uh, this is the way, again, Genesis puts it in chapter 11, verse 4. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God says, make a name for me and scatter yourselves among the world. They say, we will make a name for ourselves and we will do the very opposite of what God has said asked us to do. And you remember the story. God then confuses their language. They can no longer communicate and speak to each, uh, each other. Half of them spoke pidgin. The other half didn't. 
not just saying if you're still with me, gave them many languages. They couldn't communicate with each other, uh, and, the, uh, and the, uh, they spread out uh, at, uh, at that point. Uh, again, so the question is, what kind of religion came out of ancient Babylon that we see in other world religions? And it is the religion of the worship of the mother and the child. Uh, and it permeates, and we could go through, and, and um, uh, I didn't want to try to figure out how to spell all of the Greek and all the other names, but uh, we could go through every culture of the world, and they all have a mother-child religion in which they, they worshipped. The original Babylonian god was Semiramis. Semiramis was the queen of heaven. Now, again, let me uh, interject our, our concern for Roman Catholicism because uh, I've, uh, uh, if you haven't grown up uh, with, uh, in a Ro with a Roman Catholic background, which is a lot of you have, some of you haven't, that is a big issue. That's, uh, they worship Mary, who is called the Queen of Heaven. Not speculation, that's what they do. And by the way, they're very proud of the fact that they see themselves as the church of Revelation 17. I need to interject. This is not something that... I'm, I'm trying to put on them. It's something they claim for themselves. If you take a tour of the Vatican or even just look through some artwork, you'll see there a large tapestry of the woman riding the beast with the ten horns and the, and the seven crowns. And below it, the plaque says, the mother church. They, 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 they see themselves uh, here in this passage. One of the popes even had a, a metal uh, minted with his picture on one side and the woman riding the beast on the other. And therefore, they can justify the opulence, the gold, the wealth, and so forth, because they are, and the Pope is the vicar of Christ. He's the representative of the God of heaven. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And as such, they would say, you can't send a beggar to represent a king. You have to send an ambassador that truly represents him. And uh, it's, a big, it's been a big issue and a struggle within Roman Catholicism for years. Men, men like St. Francis of Assisi and others uh, who basically gave their wealth away, ministered to the poor, took oath of poverty and so forth, took real issue with what was going on at their own, their own headquarters. And it, uh, it continues to be a, a problem, but uh, nonetheless, the influence all goes back to, uh, to ancient Babylon. Semiramis, the mother and child, her child, her son, Tammuz, Tammuz, by the way, is born on December 25th, uh, the birthday of somebody else, supposedly. And you can understand, is anybody celebrating anything on December 20th? I'm just checking to see if there's been any Babylonian influence over your lives in any way. I'm not really, maybe somebody, I'm not really sure. Uh, it may have influenced us in, in some way. So I'm saying this permeates the world, the mother-child worship and so forth, the queen of heaven. He is virgin born. Who's the father? He is. He is the father who becomes the son. He's virgin born. He's virgin born and then he's out hunting one day, wild boar. One of them turns against him and, bores, uh, kill, and uh, kills him. He lays dead for three days and three nights and then he's resurrected in the springtime on a holiday with another ancient Babylonian god called Estar. And therefore, we get this little thing in the spring where we celebrate resurrection, and uh, it's called Easter. It's called Easter. And uh, they do things like that in ancient Babylon. I know this has never affected any of us, like, like dyeing colored eggs and, and bringing little models of bunnies because they perpetuate life. Uh, during that December 25th, they burn a thing called the Yule Log, because that's Babylonian, and it talks about the infant son who's been born. They bring these other little evergreen trees around. They think that's very important. Now, I know this has not affected any of us. I'm just talking about other people here. <clears throat> Ancient Babylon is the mother of false religions. And we, we could look at, at Hinduism, Zoroastrian, and many other religions around the world. We're just having a tendency to focus on how it's influenced Christianity because we're... Christians, and, uh, and here's the influence. How will the false prophet be able to bring together all these peoples of the earth under one umbrella? Because there's some real common denominators because of the infiltration of the religion of, of ancient Babylon. A lot of books have been written uh, on, on this. 
uh, it, uh, it goes on and on. It's, it, it's actually pretty, pretty frightening in terms of uh, uh, all these things that have uh, uh, taken place. And keep in mind, I mean, as Protestants, we didn't, re- we didn't have Christmas. We didn't acknowledge Christmas because we saw it as coming from ancient Babylon. We saw it as a Roman Catholic thing. And that's why Washington crossed the Delaware on Christmas Day. And, and, and he surprised them because, they, because again, uh, those troops on the other side from England were reformed. They were under the Church of England, which basically is Roman Catholicism without the worship of Mary. They knew that they would be celebrating, having a day off, a day at ease. Washington knew that, and so he crosses the Delaware, and he's victorious over them because he didn't follow the religion of ancient Babylon. Very interesting. Plays a little part in our, the history of our, our country. But it permeated, it was a problem with the Old Testament saints as well. When Joshua was about ready to to enter the land, and then they're able to have some victories and so forth, uh, he comes before the people one day, and he says, as we go into the land, you're going to have to make a choice. As we go into the land, there's going to be the gods of the Amorites, and you can choose to worship them uh, if you want. And by the way, those gods can be traced right back to Babylon. He says, you can worship the gods of Egypt, where we just came from, by the way. Those gods can be traced right back to ancient Babylon. Uh, Or you can worship the gods east of the Euphrates, which was ancient Babylon. He says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord God. But you decide what you want to do. And as you know, when they got in the land, it was a big issue. It was a big problem. Calling the people, the prophets, constantly to turn from the gods of Babylon, like Baal, and others, and back to a relationship with the living God. It's been an issue from the beginning. Ancient Babylon is the mother or the harlot of false religious systems, and it's been a problem for the Old Testament saints, and it's been a problem for the (coughs) church as well, and it will be the thread from which, again, the false prophet in this religious system, they can kind of pull everybody together uh, in the end. So a definite uh, uh, relationship indicated by the name, Mystery of Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, the abomination of, uh, of the earth. Now, <clears throat> one more thing before we, we move on. Now, a few weeks ago, when we were in Revelation 2, I think that was a little more than a few weeks ago. I'll just seeing if you're paying attention or not. I think it was a couple years ago, but uh, <laughs> probably at least 10 or 11 months ago. In chapter 2, uh, if you want to turn there, I'm going to read from verse 13. Remember that uh, there was a concern that Jesus had for the church of Pergama. Do you remember what it was? He says this. He says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name, and you didn't deny my, uh, my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. In 90 AD, Jesus, speaking to John, says that the throne of Satan is in a city of Pergamos. And, uh, and we talked about it then, but it's been a while. Ancient Babylon, remember, Babylon falls to the Medes and the Persians. The priests of that ancient religion leave. And they bring their idols, they bring their religious system, and they move west. And where do they go? To the city of Pergamum. And Jesus says, that city, that ancient religion, that's where Satan lives, that's where his throne is. That's what Jesus thinks about this ancient religious system, and, uh, and he's encouraging them that they've been faithful and so forth. And uh, when we went, uh, when we were there during the city, I think I showed uh, maybe some, uh, some uh, PowerPoint slides of the city and so forth, a large altar to Zeus that was there, which is a Greek name for, an, for a Babylonian god. And, it, and it's right there. It was prominent uh, uh, in, in the city. Well, those priests then, at some point in time, crossed the Aegean Sea, same gods, Greek language, little different name, all the same. They land in the land of Italy, and they go to a particular city there. It was very populous to establish their new headquarters, the city of Rome. Now that becomes the headquarters for the religion of ancient Babylon. And, uh, and then it just so happens that, again, Constantine, Roman Emperor, 313, Edict of Milan, uh, it was uh, uh, basically saying we need to be tolerant of one another. We're going to stop all religious persecution, which if you were being persecuted and killed, you think it would be a really good thing. Uh, he ends all of that. 
but it paves the way now for Christianity to grow within the Roman citizen, and suddenly uh, you have, quote, mass conversions of people. In other words, if this ruler in this area said, by the way, today, we're all Christians. It's like somebody standing up today and go, all the people in Oahu today are all Christians. If anybody asks you, you're a Christian. Thank you very much. It's like, that's not exactly how people normally get saved. <laughs> so we would say a fair amount of these people are really not saved. Uh, but you have these mass uh, conversions, whole cultures. Uh, and one of the things that uh, uh, was uh, uh, right from the very beginning within Roman Catholicism, the missionaries that went out to share the gospel were told to basically morph yourself into and adopt the cultural traditions around you as much as possible. And that's why Roman Catholicism is so different in Spain versus the Philippines versus South America. It's virtually different because it, it morphed itself into the very cultures. And it did in Rome over a period of time, then eventually adopting because it was natural because it was the headquarters. And again, that's why you have within Roman Catholicism a very prominent place for Mary, the Queen of Heaven, the Madonna, and the Child. I don't know if you ever had one of those little medals, had one of those little statues of growing up as a Roman Catholic. It all goes back to uh, ancient Babylon. Even the idea of the College of Cardinals goes back to ancient Babylon. The color red, all of these things are prominent in the religion of, of ancient Babylon. Uh, while in Rome, one of the first high priests of this particular religion there kind of a Greek Roman version of it now, takes the title Pontifus Maximus. And you might know his name from history. His name was Julius Caesar. So now you have the Roman Caesars that are part of this and eventually demand to be worshipped <coughs> as gods uh, themselves. So all of this plays, a, a, again, a prominent part. 476, uh, Rome, Rome has been in the decline for a number of years. The Visigoths raid Rome and take over. Uh, and as they do, there's no more Roman emperor. They need somebody to rise to the occasion to be some kind of an authority. The church has been growing, and now the bishop of Rome decides that he then, there's no, there's no Roman emperor using the title Pontifus Maximus. So for the first time, 476, the bishop of Rome takes on the title the Great Bridge Builder uh, because he is the bridge between, uh, between heaven and, uh, and man. So uh, again, Jesus speaks of the warning that uh, in Pergamos, it's Satan's throne. It's where he dwells. All that gets shifted to Rome, and eventually the church, unfortunately, gets centered in Rome as well. And so the teaching, the foundational teaching of ancient Babylon permeates all the world religions and eventually is able to hook itself up with, with the predominant Christian view uh, over Europe for the next 100 years. And that doesn't change, of course, to the Protestant Reformation, but some of it still flows, and it's still out there in our veins today. Now, again, I don't think that, uh, I think it's okay to have a, a chocolate Easter bunny. Just make sure you eat it and you don't bow down before it, you know. I think it's okay to have a, a Christmas tree, you know, but uh, just if you see somebody in your household on their knees in front of it, I'd get rid of that baby, you know. So you just, these things are there, they've been... Uh, engrafted into our, our very culture, uh, our religious life as Christians, but uh, often we don't understand where they're coming from. Is this a pretty good plan by Satan? I mean, he knows what he's doing here, right? I mean, he's, he's figured out a way to be able to engraft everybody in into this world religious system. You think about today, you know there's everybody around, all religions are the same. Oh, you've read a lot, you know. <laughs> Actually, they kind of don't like each other and have many disagreements. So how are they all going to come together? Because there is a common thread, and it will be done not only through this teaching uh, that, that is ingrained, but also through uh, seduction, deception that will be prevailed. And then you've got the false prophet who is able to do uh, miraculous signs and, and wonders. Let's look at the last thing here. John has shown that the woman is drunk with the blood of uh, of believers, verse 6, I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with great amazement. So again, she's, uh, 
drunk with the blood of saints and martyrs. Uh, saints is hagios, martyrs is martyrs. So uh, what we don't know, uh, there's two, two views of this. One is that Old Testament saints, uh, uh, New Testament martyrs, uh, sh- this system has been involved in persecution uh, from the get-go, and certainly that could be uh, well-documented, uh, but at the same time, it could be a reiteration. But either way, this world system that goes back to ancient Babylon that spread to other world religions that actually is infiltrated uh, into much of the church today is guilty for much of the blood of Christians throughout history, and that's going to be uh, even more so in the future. Uh, and again, we, we've talked about the fact that uh, the blood of the saints are the ones that are crying out for vengeance from God. Back in the fifth seal judgment, chapter 6, they cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell in the earth? <laughs> chapter 16, verse 5, And I heard the angel of the water saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things, for they <clears throat> have shed the blood of saints and prophets. And then we'll see in verse 24, the following chapter, in her, in her was found the blood of the prophets and saints and all who were slain on, on the earth. One thing is for certain, it's one of the reasons why there's these cataclysmic judgments upon the earth because, uh, because of the blood of the saints, of men and women and children through the centuries and during that time that are killed because of their faith in God, their faith in, in Jesus Christ. That's going to continue. And when John sees all of this, and um, you think he might know just a little bit about ancient Babylon because of what he's witnessed in, just in his day. Again, he's not a Greek philosopher. You know, he's a, a Jewish fisherman, but still living in Galilee, he would be quite aware of the Old Testament and these things and these issues. And our final part of the verse says, when he sees this issue and what it becomes in the future, he's amazed. He's just in wonder and amazed that this could actually happen with the church that he is writing to at that time uh, in, in 90 A.D. <clears throat> uh, one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, issues, of course, in going through this, and it's lots of information, uh, I try to break it down. And Can you tell I'm going slow? <laughs> I'm just trying to keep us all moving through this because you just read through the stuff. You keep reading, it's like, who is that guy? What does that mean? What does it mean? He was, he will, and he will be, a, you know, it's like we just kind of keep breaking it down. What does it really say? You know, uh, we're, 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 what is the purpose of this writing, and, and where is it going, and, and of course, what it means to us. I think what it means to us is we need to be very careful, because Christianity was never meant to be a religion. It was meant to be a relish, relationship with the living God, and, and we need to be focused that on, on that end when we're worshiping, as we gather, as we read the word, as we share our faith with, uh, with other people. I want to close, I got a little video clip of a guy that uh, got saved. It's called Escaping Religion, and, uh, and he does. In his case, it was Islam, grew up in Iran, had to leave when they had a little war going on over there in 1979. It's, uh, it's a great little, little clip. I actually grew up not too far from here. I grew up in Iran. And in 1979, I saw religion destroy my country. Religion gone wrong cost the lives of over a million people in Iran. My dad was a religious man, but not too devout. But he was also a military man. And so when the Iranian revolution happened, we escaped religion. We had to get out of Iran because the government was overthrown by Ayatollah Khomeini and his zealots. So when we escaped and we came to America as refugees, basically, we came, and in my mind as a little boy, we were escaping religion and God's representation. And so for years and years in America, I wanted to have nothing to do with anything that had a cross, a crescent, or a star, or anything on it. Well, one day, a buddy of mine invited me to go to church with him. Now, he wasn't really a devout Christian. He was just hanging out with me, and he invited me to church. And this was after high school, and I told him, I said, look, I don't want to go to church. I hate religion. I told him all the reasons. I told him how it had destroyed my country. But my buddy said, no, 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 no. This is a Muslim stuff, man. This is Christian stuff. And I'd seen Christianity on TV, honestly. I'd seen people with big hair sitting in a golden chair, you know, saying, Jesus loves you, show me the money or whatever. And so I told him all the reasons I didn't want to go to church. And instead of giving up, he ends up giving me the name of five of the hottest girls from our school. And he says, look, they all go to my church. And so I felt motivated to go visit. And I've got to admit, I went for the wrong reason the first time I ever went. 
But when I went there, I saw not religion, but grace. I saw real people, not religious people, not people who acted really cleaned up, but just forgiven people who were dealing with everyday life stuff, but there was something different about them. The grace of God had made them gracious, had made them graceful. And every Monday, these people would come and visit me. They had this thing called visitation. And I'm telling you, every time they came over, all they talked about was Jesus Christ. They didn't talk about all the things I was doing wrong. Instead, they kept telling me about all the things that Jesus had done right. And Jesus, to me, was a religious figure. And so I kept telling them, I don't want to have anything to do with religion. And they would say, we don't either. This isn't about religion. This is about Jesus. Well, one night, I went to their church. They dragged me there. And when I was there, I heard this preacher preach. We're talking about an old school Southern Baptist preacher, guy with a comb over. And he's like, come on down. We'll condemn you and the kids. You're going to fry in the head like a piece of sausage, you know? And, and he was passionate. But when you're lost, you don't see it as passion. You see it as anger. I remember thinking, man, if the gospel is such good news, why is this guy so mad? But I didn't realize he just believed enough in what he knew to be the truth that he wanted me to hear it. And that night, I felt convicted because he was telling me the truth. But when you're lost, you don't see it as conviction. You really see it as a guilt trip. So during the invitation, while other people were going forward, I hit the aisle and I went the other way to get away from church. Well, I went home and I realized something, that God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's not just contained in little church buildings. And when I got there, God continued to convict me. I eventually opened up a Bible in my room really late at night. I was home all by myself that night and started to read. And I read a story about a man named Peter who on a stormy night was called out by Jesus to step out of a boat. That Bible all of a sudden jumped out at me. In an instant, God said, David, I want you to step out and I want you to trust me. Just as Jesus was saying to Peter, come, he was saying to me, come. I just hit one knee and I said, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I know you're the only hope that I have for cleansing. I know you're the only hope I have for salvation. I offer all of myself to you. I submit my life to you. And everything changed that night. That night, the old me died and a whole new me was born again. But I realized that moment was this, that Christianity is not about bad people becoming good. That's religion. Christianity is about dead people becoming alive in Christ. The night that I became a Christian, my parents hit the roof. When they found out that I'd given my life to Jesus, my dad became very devout as a Muslim instantly. He was like, you can't be a Christian, but Muslims. And I was like, we are? We've never been really that devout. But then he thought, you know what? It's just a stage in David's life. He's got a tennis racket because he wanted to be Andre Agassi. He's got a guitar and all the guitar lessons never panned out. He's done all these different things. He's got a surfboard, even though we live four hours away from any body of water. Let him just have a Bible and he'll get over religion. But they didn't realize that when you give your life to Jesus, when you really do that, it's not like a cold, a Christian cold that you catch and it goes away. It's a whole new you. And the night that I went to get baptized at my church, I got kicked out of the house for my faith. But within five years, the same parents that kicked me out of the house, one by one, my entire family, not just my mom, not just my dad, but my sister and my brother, had come to know Christ as their Savior.
together.